Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it that you spend your time with us. I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for that amazing introduction. Please check out his website. It's nativestorytellers.com and it provides us with another understanding of how history is preserved in another culture that uh, preceded the current culture with the written word and often the written word is not as accurate as that which is told by voice and story. So check it out. It's a really cool site. And if you enjoy this show and our other shows, please do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We really appreciate that following as well. Mark has an amazing guest tonight. I, and I just, you know, sit back and, and be ready to be amazed and educated, enlightened, and entertained because this is one of the the best shows that we've had on in quite a while, and I'm very excited about it. I got my pencil and paper out, and I'm going to take notes along with the rest of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark now. Mark, it's all yours. Okay. How are you today? Doing well. Good. Okay. Well, let me, um, it started on a few announcements here. I need to say happy birthday to... Tara, uh, she's not a groupie. She's my lovely cousin. Uh, today's show is the first anniversary of our first co-hosted show. Um, Barbara and I had collaborated to bring many excellent shows to our loyal listeners for about four years prior to the formation of Nightlight Part Two. Um, so, so when I, so when I was fired again, she she knew what I could do, but she wasn't counting on the Houdini meltdown. Uh, that wasn't uh, good listening. Uh, but it could have been therapeutic for the guest. Uh, we just, <laughs> um, it just wasn't the help we were planning on. Um, yeah, we had one guest for some reason was preoccupied with her video for a radio show. And uh she kept adjusting her camera and ended up unplugging her mic and didn't realize I was sending her messages to plug something back in, so I had to finish the show for her. Well, then halfway through the next guest, you know, I got the call where my dad fell and I had to abruptly leave the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another guest was reluctant to speak on a talk show. That was entertaining. Uh, then there was, yeah, uh, the, then there was the Greek cuisine show proposal. Uh, you never heard that series because it was shot down faster than a UFO during the Battle of L.A. Yep. And one, one shot. Bar- that's all it took. <laughs> yeah, so, you, know, you know, the one shot took down the whole fleet. 
uh, yeah, the barbecue guy had a great book, but uh, he needed to reschedule. Uh, so, yeah, the culinary arts shows are not even on the back burner, not even on the stove at this point. But um, I don't know. We'll, we might <clears throat> do something with them at at, at some point. Um, yeah, about half a dozen contributing authors to an excellent book, uh, new book on Cahokia, thought we were just too weird. <laughs> so uh, aside from some flub shows, I, I'm glad uh, Barbara had the maturity and education to recognize uh, PTSD. Uh, I connected us with a c- couple publishers, and we recently got established with a few more. So, so many of our uh, shows have been new voices to both of us. You know, like Richard Balthazar, Ahmed Osman, Steve Asher, Dan Duke, uh, Graham Phillips, Lon Krieger, Ron Redmacher, Steve Ward. Oh, you know, uh, Brenda, uh, Steve wanted to tell you hi. And oh, Cat Hobson. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I had him on a couple other shows, but uh, huh. yeah, uh, Scott Scott was is new to you. Uh, some mm-hmm. have returned to uh, you know, uh, my show because they know that you know I'll have a reasonable discussion about their books, like uh, Mark Mirabello and Bill Mann, Catherine Children, Gary Wayne. Uh, you know, brought independently published authors to uh, you know, David Collis, uh, David Brody. Darla Spencer, Jason Gerald, and Jeff Walmsley. From what uh, we've heard from authors and publishers, Nightlight was uh, the very first interview they did on their, their new book, you know, like last week with Andrew Collins, uh, Ramon Jimenez, and Mark and Lori Nicholas. And there were several occasions when uh, we were discussing uh, the, the book as it was just becoming – Available. Uh, Dan Duke is one. Uh, Mark Dewisiak, who, who will be our guest next week, and our guest tonight, Brent Rains. Um, and you know, we're what's like in the middle of a uh, six-show series where we're, we're uh, kind of promoting, uh, you know, a just. Uh, published book, so uh, you know that that's a really nice honor. Uh, then there were Merle and Arlen's new CDs. You know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> halfway through uh, the show with uh, Perry Petrie discussing the healing aspects of the pyramids, uh, Barb told me Miss Estuary became a YouTube subscriber. Maybe after 26 months, Nightlight does bring healing. So maybe, maybe that Houdini meltdown w- w- was appropriate uh, the, the show is far from a rehash of what I've done elsewhere uh, nor is it uh, you know, the same topic show after show or limited to just uh, discussing the same couple of oversaturated subjects found on many other stations uh, a couple people have even gone on to uh, coast to coast uh, and, and bar- or recognize the diversity I would bring that that was missed by others. For, for just the uh, two of us doing a lot of the work, uh, we are proud of what we've done for the last year. Uh, we aren't like formulaic, formulaic country music singing about, you know, my tractor broke, so I got drunk and kicked the dog, and the old lady kicked me out of the trailer. Uh, we're more unlimited and experimental like Jimi Hendrix. I think the listeners. I thank the listeners for appreciating what we are doing, especially Seminole Lisa, the Human Billboard, the Red Dragon Rider, Serenity, and the crew. And thank you, Barbara, for believing in me. So uh, we are meant to be crazy. And with that quote from John Keel, let's move into getting our guest on. Um, Brent Rains is returning to be our guest tonight. Uh, when Brent made his debut with us, 
It was last fall when we discussed his upcoming biography on John Keel. Well, it's now available. And if you want to learn more about Keel's legacy, adventures, research into the unexplained phenomena, and how it influenced late night radio, uh, get a copy of John A. Keel, The Man, the Myths, and the Ongoing Mysteries. Brent is also the editor and contributing author to apmagazine.info that's you know alternate alternate perceptions magazine and he will be a presenter at this year's mothman festival to be held at point pleasant west virginia on september 20th through the 22nd so welcome brent thanks for returning well thank you mark and thank you barbara uh it's always a pleasure to, to chat with the two of you and your listening audience. Thank yeah. you very much for having me on. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. I just uh, – uh, this, yeah, this was a, a year ago, uh, you know, we did our first show, and I just wanted to you know, just take a few minutes here to s- summarize <laughs> the, <laughs> the year. But um, – yeah. yeah, you uh, j- just wrapped up being a presenter at the Alien Expo. Um, how did that go? Is that uh, becoming like a East Coast version of like Contact in the Desert? Uh, yeah. You know, how how was it? Uh, actually, there was their uh, their first conference here in in Tennessee, a major conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was in Knoxville, and they had it at the convention center. And um, it was August 17th, 18th, and Katina Kyle is the driving force behind that. And she plans another one next August. Had uh, such speakers besides myself as uh, Kathleen Martin, who is, of course, a uh, well-known uh, abduction researcher, author, worked with uh, – co-authored books with Stan Friedman and uh, she also is the uh, the niece of Betty Hill who is of course one of uh, Betty and Barney Hill a famous uh, UFO abduction case right there one of the better known mm-hmm. ones and uh, there was uh, Ray Hernandez of the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Extraordinary Experiences out of Miami, Florida he was there as a presenter a Reverend Michael Cotter um, who I believe you recently interviewed on, on oh, yes. your, your show. Uh, he got a, a standing times. ovation. <laughs> he's a great, great. Uh, he's a former actor and an activist. Uh, uh, he's a racial uh, activist and and uh, a contactee and has a real. We we just did a show uh, last night with him for you know pre-recorded for alternate perceptions will come out. Uh, um, at the first of September, and we got to talk a lot about different religions and how the contact, what the contact, you know, some of the components of the contact experience and such. And so it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's going to be really, really good. I also had two co-hosts, uh, 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 Russell Scalpone, who's a uh, psychologist, and a uh, uh, friend up in uh, Missouri, uh, Lynn Miller, who was, who also used to work with Free. So. And then uh, Travis Walton, who hardly needs any introduction, an abductee from 1975 out in Arizona, and he seems to be just about at every conference from what I can see. Uh, mm-hmm. Tom Reed, who also lives in the Knoxville area, who had uh, alien abduction fam- uh, experience back in 1966 or 67 in Massachusetts years ago with some other family members. Angelia Shear, who is a... Uh, uh, for the last three years has been uh, state director here in, in Tennessee. And uh, she also spoke and she's, uh, she's writing a book on many of the cases she's investigated. And uh, she's very open also to the paranormal dynamics of these experiences. And uh, very, and she's a good friend of Travis Walton. And then there's um, Stephen Bassett, uh, who's uh, very uh, very keen on the disclosure movement, doing what he can to help there. And Dean Haglund uh, was there. Um, Mary Joyce he, was there. Uh, yes, Mary Joyce from North Carolina. 
she was there. She just submitted a uh, article for our next issue on the Cherokee little people. And uh, Andrew Gao of uh, NASA Unexplained Files and uh, uh, Mike Barra, Ancient Aliens. Uh, so that's uh, and of course me, and that so that's a uh, pretty well wraps it up there. But their uh, this is their first one, and it was uh, it was a huge one. Lots and lots of vendors, and uh, there was a crowd of people uh, there. I know Saturday was the biggest crowd. Uh, the conference room, which seats uh, I think a little over 400, was full. Some people were standing in the back, and uh, Sunday, I guess you know. Church day, uh, there wasn't quite as many, and that's when I spoke. But anyway, <laughs> but you know, it was well attended, and they did a great job. And in March, they got Nick Pope, Pope, and uh, from England, uh-huh. and uh, also uh, Peter Robbins is going to uh, do a uh, uh, a one day presentation to both of them uh, in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So, uh, and they've got planned no details yet, but sometime, I think around August 1st of next year, uh, another alien expo. So they're full steam ahead. It looks like. Okay. Uh, th- th- that's just great news that there's going to be a, uh, second, second conference. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I got to be the master of ceremonies at this one. I got to introduce, uh, all the different speakers, and then then it came my turn to speak. So I I asked Ray Hernandez, who I had, you know, uh, had a lot of uh, conference calls when I worked with Free for a couple of years to uh, introduce me, uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was quite an experience. Good. Okay, and you know, you, you and our guest from. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Steve Ward are going to be presenting at this year's Mothman Festival. So, uh, yeah, we can kind of start there and bounce sure. back and forth between your biography of John Keel, the actual Mothman Prophecies book, and you know, uh, Jeff Walmsley's book, what's in the uh, museum, uh, so, so we can just kind of go all over the place there. But it, you know, you, you're going to be speaking what sa- Saturday the 21st? Yes, yeah, Saturday. Uh, what I'm looking at is I'll be actually the first speaker at 11 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it'll be one hour in length, and I'll be uh, talking about uh, John Keel and and uh, you know the things really that are that are in my book. My book is has biographical information about Keel, telling about things about his life and uh, his uh, studies and and uh, his travels and such. And then uh, and then I also interview a number of people who knew Keel and uh, have been influenced by Keel, and uh, including myself. And I'll bring out new cases that. Uh, um, haven't been presented before in the cases that I've worked on, you know, and, and try to give kind of an overview. Uh, and I had a lot of help from uh, uh, the late Rosemary Ellen Guiley, a, a very well-known uh, writer and, and publisher researcher who uh, strongly identified with Keel. And Keel was a friend of hers and I interviewed her and she wrote the foreword to my book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whereas Keel thought they were like something like ultra terrestrials, he called them, who lived in a parallel world, which was only speculation, but he he felt it was uh, a pretty valid one. And uh, Rosemary had come to a very similar conclusion when she was originally going to publish my book. And when we talked late last year about uh, this this effort, and she went through my my manuscript and made a lot of suggestions, and uh, and uh, she even suggested some people she knew who knew Keel, like uh, Michael Grosso, who was a PhD mm-hmm. in philosophy and uh, had a lot had experiences of his own, uh, UFO paranormal and, and uh, spoke at Keel's uh, 14 uh, meetings that he had in, in New York City and, and knew Keel quite well and, and, and also uh, you know some other people. Um, and so this was a tremendous help and it uh, you know unfortunately I I didn't know at the time that she had cancer, and and uh, 
she had told me that she had always thought about writing a, a book on Keel. And uh, I said, well, there's, there's plenty of uh, opportunity to still do this. I said, Keel covered such uh, so much terrain in this field. Um, and, you know, I'm, and I, I said, I'm sure that you've got many, many stories, having been so close to him, that uh, you could go on and, and others as well and write things. Uh, Keel had told me uh, in the 90s um, in a letter that uh, – he could have written about six books about his, you know, uh, besides just the Mothman Prophecies, which was published in 75 and, of course, became uh, a, a movie by the same name in 2002 with Richard Gere and Laura Linney. Of course, it was quite watered down from the uh, book itself, uh, and uh, there were a lot of details changed. But Keel was happy that it, uh, you know, it... Uh, it came out and and uh, gave the feel of what happened, uh, even though it portrayed him, the character, uh, as being married uh, to someone in law enforcement, no less, and jumping into the um, Ohio River when the bridge collapsed, the Silver Bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all the a lot of different details, but he said it the the whole atmosphere of the experience was pretty pretty you know brought back a lot of similar feelings he felt so anyway um i attended the 2015 mothman festival that's uh uh, in uh september of 2015 and that's when i met steve ward and uh i also did some video interviews which is on on youtube um with uh stan gordon from pennsylvania longtime ufo and cryptid researcher uh, um, from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I think his, I think he's been studying this stuff since 1965, so a little longer than me. And uh, in fact, I met him, I had been to his home about 40 years earlier. Uh, and so we, I said, we gotta, we got to catch up again sometime sooner than this. And, uh, and that's where I actually met Rosemary for the first time, too, and I did a little interview with her video. And uh, and Steve was giving the hay rides, uh, one of the people giving hay rides in the uh, TNT area that weekend. And uh, you know, it tells a little of the history as you ride along there. And uh, of course, they have this the Frick brothers, uh, Tim and John Frick, who are big enthusiasts. They often dress up as the Men in Black, and they uh, created a. Uh, kind of a dummy type thing to look like Mothman has the eyes light up and they have it on a line. And as people are riding through the, uh, the area, the, uh, this thing slides through the air above them. Surprise. (laughs) And, uh, we had some, uh, some young MIBs on golf carts who tried to persuade us not to go in. And, uh, my, my grandson, who's, you know, 11 now. He was a little younger back then. Uh, he uh, he stood up and uh, told them, "I'm not scared of you." <laughs> so I think that intimidated him right there. <laughs> but it's a it's a fun event. I think they I think they've been drawing over 10,000 people uh, the last few conferences. Uh, you know, and and it's it's something for the serious researcher and something for. Um, people who are just curious and of course a uh, fun event for children as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it does offer something for the whole family. Um, it, it is Halloween in September, but <laughs> there, there's just a lot of uh, family activities there and the, the speakers are, uh, you know, world class lecturers on a lot of these topics, and what last uh, last few, few years, what uh, Nick Redfern and Ken Gerhardt have been there. Lyle Blackburn was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lauren Coleman was there, um, and you know, you and Steve are going to be uh, some some of the lecturers. Uh, uh, this year, 
uh, but you know, there's a- always a good lineup of speakers. Yeah, and I remember. I remember when I uh, uh, talked with uh, Rosemary there uh, in 2015 and interviewed her, and she said it was uh, it was one of the places that she. Um, Never missed unless, you know, it was a good reason. And unfortunately this year, uh, uh, one, you know, bad reason really, but, you know, it happened. And uh, But they're going to have a little uh, uh, Steve Ward and uh, Joe, Joe Medea, who uh, he and his wife Tanya uh, were, became very close friends with Rosemary uh, nearly 10 years ago and went on investigations and, and, and things together. And uh, they're going to do a presentation, which they're going to uh, talk about Rosemary and do a tribute to her. And, uh, and of course, I want to talk about her too some and how she she helped me to produce this, this book. Uh, passing, sadly, just uh, five Five days after my my book actually was published, I, I ended up you know self publishing it uh, because there just wasn't time for Rosemary to you know do any more with it. She had you know her plate full and she was uh, of course ill. Uh, Brent, you, you know, you've been there uh speaking several times and you know just visited the area uh what what keeps you go, going back to point pleasant is it you know wanting I, i'm sure it uh helped in writing your biography about uh, retracing uh john keel's steps through the town and every, every you know little restaurant where Mary Hire's office was located. Yes, have you been planning this biography for a long time? Or oh no no, um, you know I I began corresponding with Keel back in October of '69, and uh, for a couple of years there I had pretty extensive correspondence with him until I went into the service in '72. And uh, and then we kind of lost touch for a while, and uh, and then we got back and you know back in touch, and I, I made several phone calls to him, um, and uh, a few more letter exchanges. But he was a great influence, a big influence in, in my my interest in in uh, an alternative theory to UFOs. When I first started, you know, I thought uh, it was just simply one explanation, uh, extraterrestrial nuts and bolts craft. And then I was intrigued by his idea that it was more complex, that there were these poltergeist, uh, paranormal elements of various kinds that crop up in these cases. And, um, and that, uh, this was a global phenomena and it, and it, it wasn't anything new. I mean, it, uh, we've been researching this for, uh, a little over seven decades now, but uh, this phenomenon goes back to, uh, you know, probably the biblical accounts of Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel and other things sound suspiciously like UFO-type phenomena. And um, so I, I reasoned that it was very much uh, more complex and uh, perplexing than, than the ufological mainstream was uh, contending. And uh, so that's – I think if it hadn't really been for John Keel, myself, and many other people probably would have long ago uh, dropped out, you know. But I, I developed a really obsessive interest in all of this, and, um, you know, you can ask my wife sometimes it drives her a little crazy, <laughs> you know, because I got two rooms here with books and magazines that I've collected since the – you know, uh, 67. When I got in this, I've got uh, I got seven filing cabinets, and it takes up space here in the house. You know, and she's uh, she's uh, an artist, and uh, she does you know some quilts and pottery and stuff. And she says, "Where's the space for my stuff?" You know. <laughs> and if we're going on a trip, uh, she'll always tell how uh, we're going somewhere, and 
I'm enjoying, you know, I want to get to where we're going to have some family time. And what does Brent do? Uh, he says, you know, back in 1966 in this town, there was such and such an incident. And she'll go, look, keep driving. Don't don't even think about stopping and going to a newspaper office or anything like that. Just keep on driving. <laughs> but I, I've not been to Point Pleasant but several times. I mean, I've been to a lot of other places. But I wish that, uh, you know, I just thought – uh, for some reason, I just thought this, you know, after Keel had passed away, that this would be an interesting uh, thing to explore how, you know, what he was doing and how it uh, influenced me and others. And I've been in touch with people uh, from around the world, uh, Brazil and Germany and Sweden and Australia, who also have been, you know, it's a global thing. He used to write articles for the uh, Flying Saucer Review uh, of prominent uh, UFO publication in, in England uh, back in the 60s and 70s. He was writing a lot of a lot of articles. And, uh, you know, Rosemary Guiley was an experiencer herself. Uh, she, uh, she had had a lot of strange experiences, came to the conclusion that maybe what often was appearing to experiences uh, and maybe even ghost hunters uh, rather than the dead were these beings called the jinn. You know, I think one of her, her clues... Mm-hmm was the the shadow people you know that a lot of people report and uh so anyway uh it feels like i'm just jumping around here and there but uh it seems to be really like i say keel covered so much territory and and i i was talking with um in fact i did an interview with anthony peak who really is into consciousness research and how uh, there are all these paranormal elements that that affect us, and how we have this this. Um, anyway, I did an interview with him back in April, and he's writing a book on uh, that involves some of, uh, I think his tenth book or his eleventh book now. Uh, he's going to actually go into the UFO experiencer phenomena. He's talked about all sorts of other areas: deja vu, precognition out-of-body experiences, shamanic experiences. Uh, like Keel, he covers all this territory, and he, he does a great job. But one of his early inspirations was was John Keel. He says uh, he and some hippie friends of his back in uh, 1970 when Keel's uh, Operation Trojan Horse came out, uh, they were quite fascinated by it, and I think it helped to open him up and think outside the box and uh, later influenced him to start doing this this research. And he was talking in our first interview a few years back for Alternate Perceptions, he was talking about uh, um, a psychologist who was hypnotizing a subject, and this presence came out of the uh, the person and, and sort of took over the session. And I said, oh, that's like John Keel. Uh, you know, in 1967 on Long Island, I started reading – during the interview out of the book Mothman Prophecies where he describes this apple being that came out of started talking to him and he mm-hmm. lost the hypnotic control of the session and uh, and the being told him that there were going to be some airplane crashes and Keel said later on uh, these crashes actually occurred and uh, and uh, Anthony Peake said that's that's it. That's what you know. The, the Greeks call the daemon, the inner guide, the, this presence that exists in the non-dominant hemisphere the, the, of the the right brain. He says, you know, this is what parapsychologists are saying. They're studying and so on. And and uh, he says hypnosis, or some sort of trauma, or some sort of uh, traumatic experience, or something can bring this presence out. And this is what he was studying, you know. And he calls it the daemon. Um, and so he was quite excited. He said, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a perfect match for what we're talking about in this interview. So um, I've just, you know, been communicating with a number of people, some of us psychologists, neuroscientists, and others who are, in, you know, interested in the uh, components of consciousness and the possibility of uh, <clears throat> some of these UFO uh, phenomena being connected with something a little stranger than just nuts and bolts craft. I mean, some of them have been, as I describe in the book, uh, credible type of observers suddenly see a craft appear, then disappear, and sometimes it's, it's huge. 
uh, goes into through solid trees or into a solid hill hillside, mm-hmm. and uh, seeing these things uh, sometimes at very close range. Uh, sometimes the being of the craft uh, appears transparent, uh, translucent. Uh, they can see through it, and uh, but it's very hard to get you know um, a lot of the mainstream ufology. Although I think now with more talk about quantum physics and the parapsychological elements, uh, as with free and other other groups of people and, and organizations, uh, that it's becoming more of something that would have been open discussion. Keel might have. It might have been better for him if he'd come, you know, still alive and came out with his theory and ideas in the present time now than uh, than he did back in uh, '67 and, and the early '70s. Um, I've in the book I quote how uh, James McDonald, who was the famous astro atmospheric uh, physicist out in Arizona, you know, uh, he was a certainly a very nuts and bolts guy, and he just had a hard time wrapping his mind around Keel's ideas. They corresponded some, and and McDonald wrote him back and said, I simply do not understand you. You just spin one mystery inside another and never get anything across in any concrete terms. Um, And that was a a problem for Keel. A lot of people saw him as controversial and an enigmatic figure in the field. And um, he... uh, Yeah, but... Right there, is, mm-hmm. th- th- there is you know the example of the uh, UFO flying into the hill and it just didn't crash; it just like disappeared into the hill. Yeah, hillside it, and going through trees. Uh, Valley actually investigated a case like that. Yeah, and uh, I. I, I I think that was an older case. It, it was from a, a younger uh, boy who was looking out the out of his window when uh, when he saw the, the UFO go, just disappear into the hillside. Is mm-hmm. is a, a case like that being studied? You know, since you were just talking about the uh, a, a lot of the science. Can, are some of these um, um, like MRIs, uh, you know, the high tech kind of ways we have studying the human uh, mind, you're revealing something about these kind of uh, 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 phenomenon that don't make sense like yeah is yeah, I, I was just kind of trying to work in this uh today's science with you know what john was kind of first it, it, it's the, the technology is so much different now mm-hmm. yeah and and now with the science advancing it i think this potential uh i was interested to find that uh back on november 30th of last year at uh at Harvard that there was a a presentation done by, by two uh, psychologists. Um, One was named Gary Nolan from uh, Stanford who has a Nolan lab there. And another one was from a a Dr. Christopher Kit Green. And they were uh, studying over a hundred experiences and they had, I think nearly a hundred, uh, non-experience as test subjects, and they were doing MRIs and studying their medical history of experiencers uh, of uh, paranormal and orbs, and a lot of these people were, were military. And uh, so I, I initiated some correspondence with uh, Gary Nolan and uh, wrote some in my reality check in alternate perceptions, I think, beginning back in March. I wrote uh, several uh, articles relating to this, and uh, because I had thought, you know, way back in 1990 when I wrote uh, the afterward to Dr. Greg Little's People of the Web, um, that it would be so fascinating if we could have some kind of brain scan uh, going on with experiences so we could see what's going on, like, you know, um, maybe when they're under hypnosis, uh, when they're reliving 
uh, memories because I've had people, uh, you know, I've read reports and had had someone tell me one time that he was an experiencer, and whenever he thought about, uh, started thinking about his encounter, that this <clears throat> this uh, red place on his neck, a little round red place, would reappear. And uh, I was actually back, I think, in January of this year, I was in Nashville talking with a lady who uh, was an experiencer and having some paranormal things uh, happening to her. And she would uh, told me that, you know, just talking about it, her her uh, the place on the side of her neck was turning red. And I checked and it was. And then later mm. uh, I checked again and, and, you know, she'd calmed down and, and it left. So I'm not sure what that is, but I, I've thought for a long time that this would be great. And they say that they, they find uh, some areas that ha- are, are, uh, have um, more neuronal t- tissue than the regular cross-section of people. And, and some of these people would claim they were hit by beams of light and such, and uh, that um, they, they kind of call this area of the brain uh, what they, they think may be an antenna somehow for these kind of experiences and uh it's the uh a pair of the brain called the pudiman and uh uh something else there <laughs> uh you can actually look this up uh actually gary nolan did a uh, a youtube interview that was i think over an hour a few months ago and it was very detailed about all this and what's interesting is i started reading it i realized wait wait Chris, Chris Kit Green, that was the guy back in 1972 who uh, who worked for the uh, Weird Desk, so-called, at Langley, the CIA, uh, because we were interested in studying uh, and trying to keep up with what the Soviets might be discovering about the uh, uh, paranormal. And so uh, he had been assigned by the director of the CIA, Richard Helms at the time, uh, to head up this project and to uh, kind of be a handler for some of the scientists and the psychics involved. And from uh, what I've been able to gather, it was, uh, you know, right off the bat, and I've also got information from uh, Hal uh, Puttoff, who was a laser physicist who worked with the Stanford Research Institute at the time, uh, studying these, these psychics and remote viewers and, and, uh, such that um, that uh, it was what really changed Kit Green, who was a skeptic, was when uh, he had Uri Geller in his office one day, and uh, uh, he called from California to Virginia talking to uh, Kit Green at his desk uh, at the CIA and uh, said, uh, by the way, uh, Uri Geller, with a psychic from Israel known for bending spoons and keys and such, he can also see things at a distance. And uh, uh, Kit Green's uh, skeptical reply, I understand, was no, he can't. And so they decided, well, let's put him to the test. Um, You know, it was one account that I read said that he was, uh, that Geller came on the phone and talked with Kit Green. Hal Puttoff told me, no, he never got on the phone. The fact is they kept him off the phone, and uh, and neither did he tell him to look at a book. He left it completely up to uh, Kit Green as to what he was going to concentrate on. And so Hal Puttoff was the go-between because they didn't want any kind of subtle clues that, uh, you know, Geller might get from listening in or whatever. And uh, so he had this book, and at the top of it, of this page that he was looking at, he had written a word. And Geller accurately said what the word was, as well as describing the image on the page. And then later on, uh, there was a second incident where he did a follow-up, and uh, and he had this envelope with all these symbols or images that he was going to see if uh, Geller could pick up again, coast to coast. And he was at his home this time. And suddenly Geller says, Oh, uh, you've just had an accident. 
uh, in your house. There's, uh, there's I, I see broken glass. I see a dog. <laughs> and, you know, Kit Green was clueless. You know, he had no idea. So he, he got up and he went in to another room and found that uh, he had a dog. His, his dog had knocked over a lamp. And uh, the description of what was there, the broken glass and the color of the glass, matched perfectly with what uh, Geller had told him. But what really cinched it and what brings him to the point now where he's recruited, you know, Gary Nolan to do this MRA research is that uh, during a couple of years later, uh, some scientists at uh, a site about 30 miles from uh, – Stanford Research Institute, uh, where it was a uh, nuclear laboratory, and they wanted to do some psychokinetic experiments with Geller. And uh, during that time, the a number of the scientists who were very uh, emphasized was very, very prestigious and very capable, very down to earth people. Uh, suddenly began having strange experiences, seeing uh, like orbs and uh, uh, an arm with a hook on the end, you know, just floating through the air, um, large, dark, bird-like figures materializing in, in around their homes. Um, and they would, you know, come in, and, and as a routine, the uh, security, some security person would ask them, you know, has anything unusual happened? What they, what they, this was a routine they did to see if maybe they'd been approached by maybe uh, someone from, you know, um, other, some other intelligence agency other than their own, a foreign government or something, trying to find out some information from them or something, and uh, just to check on their well-being. And they started all of a sudden when working with Geller, coming up with all these very strange stories. And uh, and so he became interested at that point because he came, he flew out to California and met these people. And some were very emotional. Two of them were thinking about quitting. Um, and uh, you know he was very puzzled by this. And so even after all these years, he now works at a hospital up in Michigan, but he's still. Uh, very, very interested in these phenomena. And so, you know, um, he's looking at UFO and psychic and uh, some part of the brain that's involved. So I, I think this is quite interesting. And, and they're, you know, Gary Nolan told me that they are pub planning to publish uh, a full report in some journal sometime in the near future. So I hope this all comes out. I mentioned to him, you know, about these cases where people were hit by beams of light and how it may have changed him. Uh, I mentioned about the uh, incidents in Brazil, you know, because I knew Jacques Belly and the late uh, Bob Pratt made a number of trips to Brazil, and they wrote, wrote it about this in, in some books. And uh, it sounded very authenticated, and there was the one island at the mouth of the Amazon, Colaris. Uh, I hope I spelled, pronounced that right, but... Uh, there was very concentrated activity there uh, during a UFO wave around 1977, 78, where uh, some 30-odd, some odd people had been <laughs> struck by beams of light. Um, in one case, uh, a figure like a, in a diver's suit was outside a hut, and, and this beam from a little, like a ray gun, struck this woman in the chest. They were all struck sort of in the chest area. And two of the people died soon after uh, being struck by and seen by a, a doctor on the island who uh, witnessed a lot of the strange activity uh, that people had been seeing. Uh, she, In the daytime, she walked out of her office, and there was this cylinder-type craft just over the main street. And she just walked down the street following this thing that was at low altitude. And the military was there, civilian journalists. Uh, the military took hundreds of feet of uh, video of these objects, and uh, uh, civilian newspaper people were there in, in a separate group and taking their pictures, and it was written up in the papers. And 
uh, Valley wrote in his book that uh, some American firm had come in and bought all the negatives up from the civilian papers, which sounds sounds like the CIA right there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so someone's got proof that these things are real. Um, but uh, when I when I mentioned that to to uh, Nolan, he said, "Oh yes, me and uh, Kiss." You know, Kit Green, we've talked quite a bit with Jacques Vallée. In fact, I'm going to see him in a few days. So I thought, okay, so they're collaborating with, with Jacques Vallée, who is, you know, one of the top-notch uh, scientists himself. So this is very interesting. And, you know, there are a lot of healing cases. Uh, I asked if they were, had, you know, doing MRIs and studying any of uh, the people with, uh, who have experienced healings and see what they can find there with MRI and such. And he said, no, we, to date, we haven't studied any of those. And uh, so that's something else I'd like to see, you know, yeah. to make the circle complete. Yeah. And Brent, since, since you, you were just discussing uh, intelligence, um, and you do have in your biography where um, – John and Mary Heyer went <clears throat> on top of some hill, and he he, he would it's he he'd tell Mary, okay, watch this, and and say something, and the uh, UFO would you know, go up in elevation or come down. Uh, it just it seemed like there there was some kind of intelligence. Got uh, guiding the craft, and, and there was a connection between uh, Keel and the the driver, or just you know the craft was alive. Well, uh, what, what do you think of that? Well, he um, he may have gotten the idea. He mentioned from uh, when he was on a hilltop, I think earlier, and seen uh, some of these boats that cruised up and down the Ohio and uh, noticed that these objects were flying around the river there and they would the people on these boats, barges would shine spotlights at them and then the lights would just sort of veer off to the side and get out of the way of the, the light beams and he went down and, uh, and later in the daytime I think and, and talked to some of these um, uh, people from these boats and, and they said that this had been going on for some time and uh, yeah he signaled Adam and Mary Heyer was a witness mm -hmm. and um, and um, he would uh, sky watch quite a bit and uh, one night uh, Mary Heyer had left him and he was sitting by himself chewing on a candy bar listening to the Long John Nebel radio show out of New York City, which of course Long John was uh, years before Art Bell and all the other broadcasts on UFOs and the paranormal. He was one of the originals. And uh, anyway, while he's sitting there listening to late night radio, and Keel was pretty much a night owl as a as a writer, and he uh, suddenly saw a uh, a craft. It looked like it was very close to his car uh, coming down, and it seemed to land in a nearby ravine. And uh, it looked circular. And it, uh, he admitted he, it scared the ejebras out of him. Uh, this was in April 1967, and uh, during a a lot of activity in the area, and also included, which I got from uh, Doug. Skinner, uh, with his permission from the JohnKeel.com website, um, that uh, we actually, I re, you know, got to reproduce the the actual notepad, you know, a copy of the notepad where he wrote down the details from that sighting. Um, but um, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay, but yeah, I was just gonna say. It you just gave us the example of you know for the but nearly year 
that John lived in Point Pleasant. Uh, you know, he, he, he was going to uh, uh, di- different hilltops in Mason County as well as o- over in Gallipolis, Ohio, uh, you know, just a, observing the UFOs over the river. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, in another section of your biography, you're talking about um, when John was in Egypt in with uh, the book uh, Jadu. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he he was also uh, observing UFOs over the Nile River. Is there any kind of connection with uh, the, these bodies of water in river valleys? So, uh, or were they USOs or were they UFOs uh, attracted to some aspect of these river valleys? Uh, you, have monu- uh, you have monuments and both river valleys, you know, like the pyramids and all the other ancient Egyptian Karnak temple and, you know, the different mounds in lining the Ohio River. Is is there something that is attracting the UFOs to these valleys? Well, that's valleys? a good question. That's a good question. Uh, of course, Keel felt that a lot of these uh, mound sites uh, were places that uh, had – seem to be attracting, you know, UFO activity. Um, and, uh, and you know, the like the, the place in Norway where they have the strange lights and objects that appear there is close to a body of water. Uh, there in Peru, you have Lake Titicaca, and there were a lot of, uh, uh, act, there's been a lot of activity there with objects going in and out of the, that, that lake. And, uh, um, other bodies of water. Um, there's a lot of, and that's actually Keel's friend Ivan T. Sanderson, uh, who came up with the term ultra terrestrial, which Keel sort of took over. Uh, his his theory. He wrote a book about the fact that uh, they may have uh, bases under under the oceans, you know, and uh, so there could be uh, something to that. Um, Keel was actually at one time interested in, in uh, whether there might be actual bases because, you know, he, he admitted that his idea of the parallel world was um, was speculation. He also was interested in, in uh, going to Sweden and looking for bases in the northern part up close to the Arctic Circle that uh, might uh, – there might actually be some physical bases there. There were strange submarine reports. And, and things, and uh, wow. he was trying to follow up on those, and uh, so now on on the Mothman thing, you know, I also put in the the book uh, a Swedish researcher by the name of Aki Franzen, who uh, back in 1969 and 1970 spent several weeks altogether coming over from Sweden uh, to Point Pleasant, and he interviewed approximately 30 witnesses. And uh, he became good friends with Mary Heyer and a number of the well-known and not so well-known uh, Mothman witnesses like Marcella Bennett and Linda Skyberry and her mom and dad. And and he found that a lot of the people were, were had been very traumatized by the experiences. And one of the things that they often talk more about than anything was the shining hypnotic glow of the so-called eyes. And uh, Marcella Bennett had been like paralyzed when she saw the thing, and and uh, her arms fell down to her side straight, and she dropped a baby girl that she was carrying, and uh, something she certainly was terrified that she did, and and uh, you know the, woke up from this condition when heard the baby crying on the ground, picked it up and ran ran to a nearby house. Um, some people thought the thing was almost robotic, um, 
you know, he had interviewed uh, a couple who had seen this thing that stretched its uh, wings out and then went straight up at high speed. It didn't seem like a normal bird because it didn't flap its wings. When I was in uh, the Point Pleasant area back in in uh, 1976, May of 1976, uh, with some friends from the Cincinnati area, um, I talked to Virginia Thomas, who was also describing Keel's uh, books, who said she had seen a six, seven foot tall gray human-like figure and when she saw it she couldn't take her eyes off it It was like she was in a trance and she said it reminded her of a robot and there was a sound associated with it like a broken fan belt in a car her her ears were making like a popping sound and um, like other you know mothman experiences she had precognitive impressions uh, seemed rather psychic um a number of people uh, Frazen had found had poltergeist act, uh, experiences following their Mothman encounters. Uh, Linda Skyberry told me that uh, she had had a number of experiences since that initial one um, on uh, November 15, 1966, uh, that she had actually been as close as three, four feet. Uh, seen a glowing red, non-blinking eyes that protruded out of the head about one and a half inches and were about two two inches in width. Um, and I also um, located Dan Drazen, who was mentioned several times in, in the Mothman Prophecies. He now lives out in California, but he's a, uh, a professional documentary producer. And... Uh, He's produced a documentary uh, recently that's on YouTube uh, called Calling Earth, and it's his study of EVP and ITC, afterlife communications. And um, the reason I located him, I've had him, I've been wanting to find this guy for a number of years, and then just by chance, or maybe synchronicity, uh, I followed up on a post uh, video that uh, Nancy Talbot, the uh, crop circle lady from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, had posted about a subject over in the Netherlands that uh, was kind of a young medium, and he would uh, uh, he was involved in some crop circle formations, UFOs, and he would seem to know ahead of time where a crop circle was going to appear, and he's been studied by a number of scientists, and Dan went over. And uh, using all these different controls that he could devise to prevent any kind of trickery, um, got some facial a facial image and some other unusual things on uh, on his film. And so I saw this video and I thought, wow, could this be the same guy? I asked Nancy. She said, I don't know, but here's his email. So we got in touch, and sure enough, it was the one from the book. And and uh, he went to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and met Mary Heyer and all the different witnesses mm-hmm. himself as well back in 1967. He even um, saw UFOs while he was there, one of which was the one that Keel described where um, they uh, saw this, this uh, UFO coming up to a cloud and, and then they're all waiting for it to come out the other end of the cloud. When it did, out comes this regular airplane like and they're like whoa wait a minute that, that, that <laughs> where did the ufo go you know and uh this is something that keel had written and he had described it to me as well and he also told about some other things that he had seen and uh he even had a um, a very strange experience um he, where he was in new york and he had this feeling like there were all these little bubbles around him and he was just in an altered state. He knew something was happening. And 30 minutes later, he gets a call from Linda Skyberry's dad saying that Mary Heyer had passed away and the time matched exactly. And um, he, uh, he said that, you know, when he met Mary Heyer, that they just had like an instant, uh, uh, connection that uh, uh, she had said something like, "I, you know, I feel like I know you from a past life or something," you know, and uh, so they hit it off, and 
anyway, um, Brett, uh, he was going to, uh, Dan was going to do a documentary. That was his intention, going down, down there with Keel uh, for PBS. And uh, he was getting ready to do that. And then PBS, for whatever reason, decided, uh, now nah, they didn't want to do it. Which is such a shame because wouldn't that be great to have had all those interviews and stuff uh, documented uh, and something like that? It, it, you know, Brent, as we've gone through, <clears throat> oh, uh, actually, past the ha- halfway point of the show, it's, it just sits in there like being really mesmerized by all this information. But, it, you know, it's, you know, you've been talking, you know, looking at you know, some of the science behind uh, how, how people responded. Uh, it's you know, being uh, the, the science is backing up what uh, t- today's science is backing up uh, what Keel was maybe thinking about, you know, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, but it, it, you, know, you do uh, talk in your book about uh, Keel was uh, doing some profiling of uh, the uh, eyewitnesses mm-hmm. uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the patterns, how, how people changed uh, before. And after seeing the Mothman or a UFO and you know, all the various other uh, unexplained phenomena that, that you cover in your book, but uh, you know, one of the points that, that you draw our attention to is abductees uh, pr- frequently gravitate towards the healing arts after. Uh, you know, their their experiences. Uh, you, know, you know what what did John attribute that to? You know, just why you know, were they healing themselves? It was it a neat, or this was what they, uh, the eyewitnesses were told, uh, or abductees were told that th- this was going to be. Their, their new lives. What, did, did John have an opinion on that? Well, John um, and I were discussing one time in a phone conversation um, about how he, even though he's a lifelong atheist, he often viewed the their the activity of the ultra terrestrials which he compared to the occult elementals um he compared these to demonic type events uh, he and i said well what about angels you know i've been reading what he and others had written about the uh um the marian apparitions and and mm-hmm. uh, the healings and such and he says no, he says I think it's deceptive. I think it's uh, it's not doesn't have our best interest at heart. And I've circulated a letter back in the '60s, early '70s, to that effect. Um, and uh, and he said I uh, I just think it turns sour in the end. Um, others have weighed in on this this thing, and and uh, I mentioned Robert Anton Wilson, who was an author and. Uh, an investigator of paranormal and UFO phenomena, and he um, he wrote an article, quite an extensive one, in Second Look magazine, uh, where he pointed out that there are different people's different reactions. Sometimes it can be a healing thing. Uh, sometimes they just so traumatized they kind of flip out. Um, Keel felt from his own studies that often after an encounter there are psychic effects uh, but sometimes they're only temporary and uh, then there's sort of a deterioration in the personality of the the experiencer Um, then on the other hand though um, you know um, 
Robert Anton Wilson felt there was some groups that he had, you know, studied and come in contact with who uh, fared very well. And I know that uh, the free study showed that a lot of the experiences, including abduct abductees, came later on after, you know, uh, after the initial shock of their experience and sometimes the trauma of uh, feeling that their experiences were somehow positive, although the, they may view these things and not agree in exactly what's who's who or whatever. Um, uh, but I know that uh, according to the survey that, that Free conducted, uh, a high percentage of them felt, came to feel their experiences were positive. Uh, but still there are many who also felt that they were abused and violated by these beings. And, um, and uh i i would like to put a a positive spin um on on all of this myself you know i i don't uh <laughs> i don't like the 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 view that that keel had the negative view um and uh some of it you know maybe it's the way that we just process these things um uh, but i definitely do think that the there is the deceptive element to these reported interactions that people have have had in their contact mm-hmm. experiences that they uh, – I get the impression that the entities really don't want us to uh, know their true origin. And so they, they ask Keel, perceived uh, perhaps they are coming up with you know different uh, things for us to uh, – believe instead of the absolute truth. Uh, but some people seem to also have healings and seem to be exhibiting a positive attitude and seems to have improved their lives, uh, not always negative as Keel had perceived. Um, and I, I talked with my friend Greg Little, who has written extensively even an encyclopedia on uh, ancient uh, Native American mounds and earthworks and has studied a lot of the Native American culture. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, you know, Keel thought of these things as a trickster, and Greg pointed out to me that, well, he says, you know, the the trickster is often perceived by the Native Americans as uh, is also a teacher. And so it depends on how you look at it. Uh, he said that, uh, first of all, these things can interact with you. They can read you. They can know your thoughts. They can know what your intentions are, and uh, they can interact with you on a like a subconscious level. And uh, and if they find that your intentions and your you know are, are worthy, then you can go up to a higher level on the level of uh, understanding and, and insight and empowerment. If, however, it's perceived that uh, your intentions are not worthy and for the betterment of mankind or whatever, then, then, you know, you're just sort of stuck where you are. (laughs) And uh, so that's another, another view. I kind of like that one a little better. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, Brent, you, I was uh, trying to find in, the several pages of <clears throat> notes, but I, I can't get uh, can't find it at the, mo- at the moment. But you you were you mentioned that uh, John was an athe- atheist, but he also recommended. For people to put crucifixes in, in their room, uh, I, don't, I forget well which case it was. Uh, was like keep the Mothman out or something. But yeah, you know, you're yeah you know, you you also uh, bring up in your book that uh, John thought that God created all these. Uh, Interdimensional, uh, you know, uh, portals, 
the, the, the cryptids. To, it, it, it's all part of like uh, God's creation. It's you know. Well, he does. Re- yeah, doesn't it really say- doesn't sh- show up in like you know the first uh, sentence of the book of Genesis, but it, it's there, there, there's something in there that you know just kind of kind of uh, tied together all this uh, unusual material with God's creations. Okay. Well, he he himself didn't, you know, uh, call it God's creations, but uh, he believed that uh, there was what he called the super spectrum, which he goes into uh, more detail in in his 1975 book, The Eighth Tower. And uh, he called, he told Doug, Skinner that it was uh, kind of a simplified version of quantum physics and he talked a lot about the electromagnetic spectrum and he felt that there was another force within the spectrum that he called the the super spectrum and this is where a lot of the uh, psychic stuff comes out and that sometimes there were places where windows uh, where the veil between the two worlds is sort of thin and and the fact that it could be a part of the electromagnetic spectrum and, and uh, coexist uh, kind of made me think of uh, what scientists are calling dark matter, dark energy uh, these days. Uh, but it's um, he didn't know exactly uh, what to call it, I guess, but uh, he called it the super spectrum. And he felt that uh, mediums, the contactees were basically often mediumistic too, and uh, this brought in. He really felt that the UFO phenomena should be a branch of parapsychology, and uh, you know he was a, a 14 who was uh, very interested in the writings of Charles Fort, who wrote about all sorts of different phenomena back in the you know 1920s and uh, I think 1931, the Book of the Dam and Low and and uh, this ranged from strange lights and objects in the sky to uh, all sorts of other strange phenomena, um, including uh, the rains of, of frogs and, and snakes and eels from the sky and so on, Th- things that he would get out of newspapers and journals and uh, put them in four different books. And uh, it became a movement called 14. And... Uh, Anyway, he uh, he uh, speculated that there were these window areas where the veil between the world, so to speak, was between this world and our world or multiple re- worlds, whatever, uh, was uh, from time to time these things would intrude or break through into our environment. And, um, you know, uh, my, some people feel that they're like – Plasmoids, they call them plasma type beings, which some people speculate that's what the jinn jin were of the Muslim faith. And, uh, and of course, the jinn can be very, very trickster like. And uh, Keel was even talking about how um, these beings could imitate us, they could shape shift, they could imitate. A person, their voice, because uh, he knew someone who had uh, had a uh, taping of a, a medium and swore that it sounded just like that person. And uh, you know, I've worked with, I was working with uh, an abductee who's had experiences with ghosts and aliens since age five, and uh, we were working on the ghost investigations. I decided to see what you know. Well, we could find out and uh, on that, and he introduced me to the ghost box, and I was, I was very skeptical, but uh, we, uh, we'd we been getting John Keel on some of these over his radio on investigations, and so I, uh, I asked him on the one-year anniversary of Keel's passing, which was July 3rd of 19, I mean, of, of 2010, we're not in the 1900s anymore, uh, you know, we were at a, a friend's house near Thompson Station, south of, of Nashville, and could we try to reach out to John Keel? Because we were going to try, you know, to communicate with with spirits, and they all thought that was a good idea. 
And within short order of uh, this abductee, uh, Brett Oldham, asking, and I think we had three tape recorders recorded this, uh, asked his uh, tech or spirit guide, can you get John Keel to say his name? And after about two, three seconds, this male voice says, John Keel. And uh, uh, I've gotten John Keel several times now. I've even got him here at my own house. My initial thought was, could somebody be having some kind of a, you know, a transmitter uh, transmitting this stuff? Of course, some of the earliest people to have uh, claimed this type of thing was possible, uh, voices from aliens or whatever coming through uh, radio was back like in 1952 with uh, George Hunt Williamson, uh, a contactee uh, back then, and, and others. Um uh, and uh, anyway, um, Keel had written that, uh, you know, instead of investigating those claims back in the 50s, uh, the mainstream ufology had simply said, this is crazy, it's impossible. Uh, if I'd had that attitude, I never would have had this experience myself. Uh, I can't say it's really John Keel coming through. It may have been one of his ultra-terrestrials, but it's... Uh, Dan, I shared it with others, and I, uh, Dan Dresden said it It even kind of sounded to him like John Keel's voice. Um, and uh, this has happened a number of times, and, and some of the responses were, were interactive. Uh, can't really say that I, I got a whole lot of information this way. For about four years, I was kind of obsessed with, with doing this and, and collecting these recordings. Um, I have some of these available uh, in alternate perceptions, apmagazine.info, uh, I think it's the February and March issues of uh, 2017 in my column, Reality Checking. But uh, anyway, anyone can, can give it a try for EVPs. Uh, I had done it years before. Nothing ever happened, but working with uh, Brett Oldham, uh, an experiencer and psychic himself, uh, got results. And so it's um, kind of interesting. <laughs> Okay. And uh Brian, I I did find that uh a passage is is uh you're right on the uh, back cover of his book, The Eighth Tower, we learn that uh there is a single intelligent force behind all religious, occult and UFO phenomena. Strange manifestations have haunted human humans since prehistoric times, beams of Light voices from the heavens, uh, the little people, uh, uh, gods and devils, ghosts and monsters and UFOs have all had a prominent place in our history and legends. Uh, and I was just kind—I of, uh, just couldn't find that uh, a passage on my yeah uh, on, on my notes at the time. But yeah, that just—I I understand it's from. You know, like a blurb on the back of the book, but it it, it does it, it, you know it makes some links between some of these things that seem like they were created so long ago and, and they've been reported on at, ever since you know through I don't know just saying you know, you know maybe some of these you know the Lasco pa uh, cave paintings or yeah, you know, expressing something like that, but you know, and we know, uh, you know, from Mike uh, talking with Michael uh, Carter uh, last weekend, you mm -hmm. know, these uh, 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 other, uh, you know, the uh, pillar of fire at night uh, that M Moses and the, uh, you know, his, his followers are. You know, kind of like marching behind this uh, thing that's flying. Well, uh, what's what's going to be flying uh, three thousand years ago? Uh, it's it, it just it, it, mm -hmm. it was just an interesting statement from your book. I, I I just couldn't find it right at this second, but that that, that was where I was getting that idea. But through, throughout your biography, yeah, there's a, a a a lot of interesting. Uh, 
information you present that gives us a little bit more insight into John uh, Keel. You know, and like uh, you know, you know, there's the uh, crucifix example, and, and you mentioned the Marian a- apparitions. Uh, there's there, there, there was something to, to his experiences that um, I don't know, right. weren't, weren't really necessarily uh, evil. It, it, it's just where where did they come from? And, and we still don't you know. I, 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 uh, you know, John even concludes. Uh, and the Mothman prophecies with, um, like, you know, he wasn't sure what he experienced. I, he, he concludes it with, my childish sense of wonder remains unshaken. Yeah, he claimed that uh, he had, from an early age, had different experiences. Uh, at age seven, had seen a, uh, a ball of light uh, rise from a hilltop. Um, in New York State, uh, his stepfather was driving, his mother was in the car, and the, they had all seen it. Um, when he was 10 years old, uh, people uh, near the, the family farm were reporting something like a gorilla, upright gorilla-looking form that was moving across the road there, and, and it scared some of the local farmers. And I think, as usual, they came out with their guns but never found it. And he had poltergeist activity at the uh at you know the family farm and uh <clears throat> when he was 18 he claimed that uh he had had kind of a mystical type experience where suddenly he was surrounded by this light and uh at that time he was living off of Times Square in New York City and uh there was a strange light and he had this n- knowing in his head that he had all the answers but by morning uh he couldn't remember couldn't bring it all back to his memory, but he felt that something had been downloaded in his subconscious. And Mm. uh, so he had these unique background experiences. And so when he finally confronted the UFO question, uh, plus seeing a UFO in Egypt back in 1954, and uh, of course encountering, um, you know, going from Egypt to Singapore back in 1954, 55, and and eventually producing this book, Jadu, uh, and having the experiences he had in India and places uh, with uh, a a holy man who actually read his thoughts. He was convinced of that. And and one time there was a Buddhist in a temple who was summoning spirits, and this stool, three-legged stool, came out of a corner and started circling around him, and it was close, and he was able to take his hands, and he's, you know, he knows magic. He'd studied magic since a boy, and uh, in fact, he one time thought about becoming a professional stage magician, but decided to become a writer instead. But anyway, fortunately, but uh, he moved his hands around the stool, couldn't find any trickery, any strings or anything, and then after it moved away and the session was over, he went over and uh, checked it for further and uh, couldn't explain that. And uh, there were also sounds on the roof, something stomping around or whatever. And then there was, uh, just before this all began, there was a, a breeze that suddenly came through the temple and blew out candles. So it's kind of a spooky experience. And uh, he also um, uh, had been hearing reports of a Yeti there and, and thought he might have glimpsed it on the other side of a lake, but couldn't be sure because... Uh, uh, the distance, and he said it might have been a bear, but uh, a lot of the, the people there were describing this creature. So with the experience back at age 10, and, and then and then these Yeti reports that he encountered over in uh, Tibet back in the 50s, uh, by the time that he got into the UFO field, he, he went to the Pentagon and uh, got nowhere with them. He was going to write an article for Playboy, and so it was just going to be a standard out of the extraterrestrial. Uh, and uh, anyway, Heinick got the Playboy assignment, but he he decided to uh, uh, – he just sold a book that uh, that actually had done really well, sold about 80,000 copies. 
and so made good royalties on it, and it was a comical type book. He wasn't, you know, uh, a novel, and so he traveled through 20 states, uh, interviewing witnesses, and uh, found that there were a lot of interesting psychic elements that uh, things that the mainstream was ignoring back then, um, like the occupants, the contact experiences, the missing time. Uh, he had written an article for True Magazine in 67, and uh, it was Never Mind the Saucer, Did You See the Guys Who Were Driving It? And he published some cases from stories from different parts of the world. And a few weeks later, this editor calls him to his office. And he walks in, and the guy points to the other side of the room, and there's six mailbags with thousands of letters from people describing experiences uh, with UFOs and even missing time. And, uh, you know, he he'd explained that he tried to talk to, uh, you know, the retired Major Donald Kehoe, who had created the uh, NICAP organization, uh, a prominent civilian UFO group that wouldn't even look at these reports back then. Um and so Keel actually, you know, before before uh, Whitley Strieber and Bud Hopkins made their rediscovery of these the prominence of these reports out there, because they had written two books in 87, Communion and Intruders, and suddenly they got thousands of letters from people who said, oh, I've had these experiences, and yet the mainstream ufology wasn't aware of the, the massiveness of this phenomena, and uh, suddenly – it became popular for people all across the United States and other countries to form support groups for these people. Um, so anyway, <laughs> okay. it's, it's just kind uh, of an interesting history, you know? Yeah, it is. Back. No, no, you, you know, it, I, you know, it's, 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 throughout your book, you present all kinds of really interesting historical studies and how John extracted something from it and applied it to his uh, research. And, you know, you know, since unfortunately we only have like a quarter of the show left, um, but one of the Keel writings that uh, we have to talk about, at least for a minute, is uh, a, a book he did uh, where, where he's looking at uh, so, some entombed animals. So, the, and there was, and he, he was examining this case of a prehistoric goose. From a stone block in France, so so there's like a, a, a precedence for the uh, singing frog from the Bugs Bunny cartoons. Well, <laughs> I don't know about the Bugs Bunny cartoon, but yeah, there were there have been uh, reports. Um, in fact, I was citing uh, I think uh, an article that uh, Jerome Clark had had written on such cases, and. Uh, and there was even this report that Keel mentioned uh, from uh, England, I believe, in the 1800s, where some people digging a tunnel reportedly this this thing like a pterodactyl suddenly right, stumbled, yeah, that's it. Yeah. stumbled out, and uh, and I think it soon disintegrated uh, after it died and coughed and and it, you know it shuffled off its mortal coil, but there was a uh, some some paleontologist or somebody who said that sounded like an, a prehistoric pterodactyl or something, uh, some prehistoric thing. And uh, so anyway, it disintegrated. And uh, afterwards, uh, as I recall, and, and I uh, was describing in that section of the book uh, um, how Peter Herkos, a famous uh, psychic from Holland, would do psychometry. And uh, there was a experiment where he was holding envelopes with different pitches and he was supposed to tell something about the contents and he actually had one of those three-toed prints of uh, a picture of a three-toed print of like a, a Bigfoot from Pennsylvania from one of Stan Gordon's cases mm -hmm. uh, and when he held it without being able to see what the picture was 
he said, it's in the process of, it's, it's alien. It's in the process of uh, disintegrating or decomposing. He says, and this, this is not right or something. And he ripped the envelope open. There was the three toed print and he drew two more toes to it, as I recall. And uh, he said, it was in the process of dying. It was decomposing or something and uh, disintegrating. And Keel talked about some of the strange rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide type odors around where these creature occurrences happened and uh, how these beings, uh, these Bigfoot or whatever, uh, appear in a certain area and they kill livestock and whatnot. And again and again, uh, the locals bear arms and they go out to kill it and it just sort of disappears and no one ever sees it again. And uh, he speculated, Keel did, that maybe the poor slobs just sort of melt away. And so um, I threw that in about Peter Herkos reading because I thought, well, that fits Keel's uh, theory right there, you know, <laughs> um, what he had said. You know, we're, you know back to Keel being one of the first to establish these types of patterns and you know, and you know and the and entombed uh pterodactyl goose bird like <laughs> creature is you know j- just one of the examples that you make us aware of in your biography. I, you know, I, I just you know, most people don't think like that, but you know, it's Keel is being one of the first uh, modern researchers to um, well, he, our, uh, our attention to it. Well, he he you know worked in Washington D.C. some too, which fueled some speculation that he'd been brainwashed or taken over by the CIA, you know, uh, you know, working for the CIA and all these other things back in the 60s because uh, he had started out looking at the nuts and bolts ET and then he saw, perceived things uh, another way and uh, he had him some history into, you know, he, he read a great deal. He called himself a reading machine, which he said inherited from his dad and uh, – and this was something that uh, he decided that it wasn't just strictly uh, this extraterrestrial thing, potentially. It could be something uh, very powerfully psychic. And uh, and so I found it interesting that back in 68, 69, thereabouts, he was working in Washington, D.C. Among the agencies he worked at was the, a technical advisor for the Library of Congress, And he also, at that time, met, I discovered, Lynn Coteau, who wrote a 400-page biography, a bibliography, sorry, of all these writings over the years of different authors, including John Keel, um, and what they said about UFOs. And she pointed out again and again, it dealt with a lot of of psychic things were coming out of this material. And her book was uh, forwarded. Uh, as I recall, to the Condon Committee, so they could uh, look at it, and uh, and actually Lynn Coteau and John Keel dated for a while, and I'm sure they both of them, with their focus on UFOs and psychic phenomena, had many interesting discussions. And I I wonder who you know if um, you know if maybe uh, she might have influenced Keel in some of his thinking too, but. Uh, I don't know, or or, or vice versa. Uh, would I, I tried to get a hold of her? Uh, I found that she had a Facebook page, but uh, no sign of any activity there. Because this goes back many years, and uh, unfortunately, many of the principals now are no longer with us. Um, but um, it, uh, I wish that had I known. You know, years ago, I mean, I, I was very interested in Keel's ideas. I never dreamed that I would write this book. Uh, this just came up about two years ago, I guess. And I thought, you know, I'm interested in this stuff. Uh, I've got some correspondence I had with Keel and 
and uh, I think I'll try to pull a book together here, and then I can also show the, some of the areas that I looked into that I felt uh, tended to tend to support or mirror some of his his studies, and uh, show the similarities of the dots I connected and uh, and other people getting to you know, of course, do the interviews with some of the others mm-hmm. like. Dan Dresden and Michael Grosso and uh, and the uh, of course the Swedish researchers Aki Fresn. I, I actually corresponded some with him and uh, Hakan Blankovic, both both of Sweden. And uh, so I just well, felt yeah. this interesting compilation of things there to consider. Well, uh, don't forget uh, Paul Eno is spoke with him a lot. A lot right. Uh, for, for the you know Paul's. You know, uh, one of the very top names in paranormal studies. Right. He also thought felt uh, from his investigations originally uh, doing ghost hunting that uh, there was something more going on, and uh, he came across the UFO psychic connections too. And and uh, you know, he was studying to uh, seminary. He was going to be a priest, but then. Uh, uh, they somebody decided he was just into the paranormal too much. It didn't uh, suit them, so he decided to become a uh, uh, a newsman instead. And I think that's uh, like Keel. I think that's where he belonged, <laughs> you know. And uh, and of course his son Ben is following in his footsteps, and they mm-hmm. they do uh, regular shows and go to lots of lectures. And their ideas are very very Keelian in a lot of respects. And uh, I so I had an interview with Paul Eno and. Uh, about his experiences and his concepts and and how um you know he he didn't meet keel he had never met keel personally or had contact with him but if he had uh it would have been an honor and he uh they would have had much to talk about and it, it, at at the conclusion of the the mothman prophecies um And John writes, you know, that there really isn't an answer. So there, there's no answer to that. Uh, some some things are just meant to be, uh, and you know, those were in references to, you know, did the Mothman have anything to do with the collapse of the Silver Bridge? And, um, but. It, yeah, John seems like he 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 was an objective uh, reporter, I don't know, almost a, a historian in some sense of the word. Um, I, I I don't think you really present him as having an agenda. Uh, he just uh, observed and his conclusions seem to be based on his observations. Uh, yeah. There might have been some speculation. But, you know, it, it doesn't seem like he uh, well, well, you know, when you, you had the... wanted a certain outcome before he even started. Yeah, I you know at the end of the, my book I I review various things that uh, you know he and others had looked at possible theories or explanations uh, and then I concluded with a, a statement uh, from Greg Bishop of the excluded middle of Radio Maestro out in L.A. who uh, had made the statement that uh, UFO subject was not only strange stranger uh, than we think it's stranger than we can think and uh you know we're still like someone at the alien expo had uh was ray hernandez someone asked him what is the truth and he said well we're just learning the questions you know (laughs) we're still a ways from really nailing it down and uh so you know keel said belief is the enemy and uh but it's pretty hard to um 
you know, untangle that. Uh, we all have some kind of beliefs that kind of are our guides through different things. Keel certainly had to have his, even though he said that and wrote that. Um, but he was busily trying to connect the dots, but he wasn't always, you know, what we call woo woo type sounding stuff. Um, he also tried to uh, present things like how Barum cloud ex- plasma experiments, uh, high altitude plasma experiments, say from Wallops Island, Virginia, were causing UFO flaps. And, uh, you know, he describes in Operation Trojan Us how uh, he was driving on the Long Island Expressway on October 4th, 1967, around 7.30, 8 p.m., and saw uh, these strange lights. Well, that same evening up in Hollowell, Maine, I was seeing strange lights too around that time, and it was these plasma experiments. And he, he later wrote about how a lot of these experiments caused a lot of our major UFO flaps, and it's very hard for people – seeing these things at a distance to tell tell it accurately the distance and sometimes these things seem to create disturbances in our our radars um he also talked about the air glow phenomenon uh that the astronauts had been seeing where spheres sometimes seem to array into formations he talked about how few uh people seem to really realize that ball lightning sometimes travels from the ground up to the sky Mm-hmm. And that could cause people to think, oh, there goes a UFO, you know. It would look mm-hmm. pretty strange. Um, and uh, and also, um, his his uh, literary agent, uh, Sandra Martin, who has a statement on the very front cover of my book about John Keel, uh, had told me in an interview that, uh, you know, Keel, uh, she was very impressed with Keel. She felt, you know, she was dealing with a man of integrity who wanted to get the truth out and that, uh, you know, image was important. And she and him had been invited one time to uh, see a psychic from some foreign country who was going to produce some, some great stuff. And uh, it was in the basement uh, of uh, the home of, In- of Ingo Swan. And uh, anyway, they had a seat right up front and they're waiting to see the performance and that's what it was. Uh, she said as soon as it began, uh, this guy stood up in front of the, the crowd, and there were newspaper reporters there too, and he held his hands apart, and this object seemed to levitate up between the hands. And at this point, Keel tugged on her shirt or tapped her shoulder or something and says, we got to go now. And what? <laughs> he says, follow me. And they, they went outside, rushed outside, And then they're out on the sidewalk, and she says, okay, John, uh, what's this about? And he said, I can take you several blocks down here to a magic shop, and I can can, uh, show you that trick and teach you that trick in about five minutes' time. (laughs) And she said that uh, he was very protective of her and knew Mm -hmm. that, you know, she was a literary agent trying to deal with factual things, and he didn't want any of the newspaper people to take their picture at this, mm-hmm. which he identified as being a fake performance. And in fact, the parapsychologist who brought the guy there, uh, Doug Skinner, told me that uh, Keel later was uh, talking to him and trying to explain that you've got to really know a little bit about what to look for. You know, I know a little bit about the magic tricks, sleight of hand, because uh, these guys can just, you know, put on a show and, and uh, you need to catch on to this stuff. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, you know, yeah, Brent, and you know, you uh, let us know that after what Keel was, you know, basically spent a, a year in Point Pleasant after all these e- event uh, moth the first Mothman sightings and the Silver Bridge collapse and the men in black uh, descending on the town. It's all, all all this crazy stuff going on. Uh, yeah, he was also aware of the uh, New Jersey devil 
story being around for over 200 years and several uh, other uh, similar cases like the, the Madisonville uh, case and you know the flying uh, humanoid from New Mexico that you bring up. It, it, you know, he, he was j- just really uh, uh, burned out on all this kind of material, and he, he he almost didn't even write the Mothman prophecies. And right. Just, uh, uh, right. And you know, you know, you, know, you, you draw attention to his his uh, agent encouraged him when he basically didn't want to do it, and we almost never had th- this really fantastic book. Yeah, he was, he, uh, you know, in fact, when he wrote me one time, uh, years later, that uh, he no longer found the Mothman uh, that interesting anymore. It was a global thing that's happened uh, many, many times over. And, uh, but he had, you know, back at the time when he was investigating all of this, he, he made about, I think, five trips total to Point Pleasant. Uh, because so much activity was going on there, and he felt that he needed to concentrate on uh, areas where uh, there was high-level ac- activity. He felt it was a window area. Talking with Rosemary Guiley, she felt it was certainly a window area with a lot of history of uh, many strange things going on. She said that she had seen out in the TNT area uh, these uh, shadow-type figures, and uh, – on various occasions, and also at the local low hotel there in uh, downtown Point Pleasant, uh, it's supposed to, a reputation of being haunted. And she said mm-hmm. she'd seen, you know, uh, heard voices and uh, strange lights there, as well as other people having experiences. Uh, so it's just uh, she felt it was kind of a a window area, as Keel called it, and uh, she she and others were actually uh, were. She called him the Mothman Irregulars, her and a group of friends uh, like Joy and Tanya Medea, who had known her for nearly 10 years. And of course, Steve Ward and John and Tim Frick um, uh, would get together and, you know, visit Point Pleasant and other areas, you know, nearby uh, at times, in addition to being part of the Mothman Festival. And, uh, probing into these stories and these uh, similar events. Uh, in fact, uh, the Medeas um, had come to the area of Point Pleasant and visited the TNT area, and on their way back from TNT area going down uh, Route 62 toward Point Pleasant, mm-hmm. had an experience with uh, some sort of being, and the landscape had uh, changed. If, if I had known of that story... <laughs> uh, as I was writing this book that I wrote here uh, that we're talking about, I, I would have included that story as well because I deal with reports similar of, um, you know, the Keel also mentioned of of how sometimes people report that the landscape has, has changed. Of course, I, am, I investigated uh, some material similar to that. So, I mean, it's, um, it's just to show some of the high strangeness things that Keel – did study and that other people have also found in uh, their own investigations. Um, and when Keel was writing early on material for Flying Saucer Review over in England that had an international readership, and uh, you know, it, it seemed like uh, finally he was being vindicated, and, and uh, other people from other countries were looking at their cases and finding similar patterns. and. Tim Beckley uh, told him in an interview, doesn't it seem like now you're you're vindicated? And Keel said, no, actually, uh, we've just opened Pandora's box. Um, we've just made the thing more complicated. <laughs> it, it, yeah, the, um, yeah it, it, you, you make us aware of how complicated all these um, unexplained phenomena are, and it, it, it's a it, informative uh, book you have that you know just tra- traces the history of 
his research and how it all I- impacts us. And, and uh, I thought you did an excellent job. Well, I appreciate it. And Chris, it's it's not strictly a, a biography. It's it's got a biographical type material, but um, it's got interviews of people reflecting on mm-hmm. his influence and you know people who knew him and and could share direct experiences. But also, you know, what myself and others have found that kind of confirms in our connect the dot efforts uh, with some of the things that he was fascinated and interested in. And um, he was a pioneer. Yeah, he was a pioneer, and a lot of us are, as has been said, uh, I think Rosemary said it, uh, we're standing on the shoulders of Keel and others who preceded us and and carrying on. Um, and now we're carrying on. Uh, Rosemary's uh, legacy as well, um, and her her studies and trying to continue the effort to better understand these uh, mysterious occurrences. Okay, and, and Brent, um, you know we're down to a little over five minutes left. Um, yeah, you know, you'll be uh, speaking 11 a.m. on Saturday, September 21st at the State Theater in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Uh, I, I assume you're going to have your books on sale. Yes, I'll have a vendor's table, and and I'll have uh, my my book on John Keel, and I'll also have copies uh, of my first book, Visitors from Hidden Realms. And uh, actually, at the Alien Expo, I sold about an equal number, but I didn't get to talk until. Uh, early Sunday afternoon, there was fewer people. Uh, but here at you know the Mothman Festival, I expect that it, uh, it should do pretty good since I'll be. It's the Mothman Festival, and it's about Keel and uh, and all. And I I believe that the audience will be more interested. <laughs> okay, and okay, you have the interview with uh, Michael coming up. September 1st? Or it's uh, released September yes, 1st? Yes, September 1st. I uh, have an audio interview with uh, Michael Cotter. And uh, 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 where, where, where is that, where's that going to be found? Uh, that'll, be on, that'll be on the website, uh, apmagazine.info. And for the whole month of September, you'll be able to find that interview as well as other features and um, and then at the end of the month uh, when October 1st rolls around and we produce an October issue of alternate perceptions then the September issue becomes archived and so when you visit our site you'll see up at the top of the page where you can uh, check out uh, uh, links to other previous issues so there's a lot of reading material not just the issue that's current but uh past years uh, worth of previous issues as well okay uh you know we have about a, a minute left uh, do you have any contact information you want to give out or sure um uh, brent rains at yahoo.com uh brent rains is one word b r e n t r a y NES at yahoo.com and uh, would love to hear from anyone that uh, you know wanted to share their thoughts or experiences, stories. And also, I'm on Facebook, uh, Brent Rains, and then uh, also I have a Alternate Perceptions Facebook page as well. Okay, we're uh, uh, Barbara. Do you want to say any last words? As we conclude the show, happily, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I start it and I end it. Sure, um, I want to thank everybody for listening. It's been a fascinating show. I hope everybody took notes like I did. Uh, make sure to uh, listen in to the next shows next Monday and Tuesday. We're looking forward to more fun stuff, enlightening stuff, and certainly. Uh, material that will make you think and and possibly stretch yourself a little bit too. So thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And this will be on YouTube tomorrow. 
You can catch it there if you missed it tonight. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Good night, everybody.